Welcome to the Compounders Podcast, where we explore the anatomy of public company wealth creation stories. On this show, we invite you to be a fly on the wall for the actual conversations professional investors have with public company CEOs. I'm your host, Ben Claremont, a partner and portfolio manager at Cove Street Capital. In these conversations, I interview senior executives by posing the exact questions I ask as part of Cove Street's diligence process. Whether you are a professional investor, founder, or someone who is simply interested in business, we think this podcast has something for you. This season of Compounders, The Anatomy of a Multibagger is sponsored by Tegas. Tegas is an innovative and disruptive company that is changing the way professional investors work. For more information, please visit their site at tegas.co. All opinions expressed by your hosts and the podcast guests are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Cove Street Capital or any affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not investment advice and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. We are not recommending the purchase or sale of any securities. The hosts and guests may be beneficial owners of the securities discussed. You should not assume that the securities discussed are or will be profitable. My guest on the show today is Peter Holt, the CEO of the Joint Corp. The Joint is a $1.4 billion market cap company that operates and franchises a chain of chiropractic offices. The company currently has over 600 total locations in about 35 states. Peter took the reins as CEO of the Joint in 2016 and has overseen a stock that has appreciated from under $3 in 2016 to close to $100 today. In fact, The company was distinctly unprofitable when Peter became CEO, but has since started generating very healthy margins with limited capital expenditures. Given all the recent success, I was excited to talk with Peter about the demand drivers that have been propelling the company over the last five years, the elements that have allowed the stock to appreciate so rapidly in recent times, how he goes about making sure the company doesn't grow too fast, and how Peter thinks about creating win-win relationships with franchisees. For full disclosure, Cove Street is not a joint shareholder. And without any further ado, here is my conversation with the Joint Corp CEO, Peter Holt. As always, we will start this podcast at a critical moment in the company's history. For the Joint, it sure feels like the company's trajectory and fortunes changed when you became acting CEO after a short stint as COO back in 2016. So I'm curious, what originally attracted you to the company overall and what, and what excited you about becoming the next CEO? No, listen, it's a great question. And I came at an incredibly opportune time. Um, but what does that mean? A lot of challenges. And that uh, I have been building and managing franchise systems for over 35 years. Uh, it's a space I know. It's a space I love. And over those years, what I've learned is that each one of us brings a certain skill set into wherever we go. Um, And and in this franchise model is that we have all kinds of different industries that are utilizing the methodology of franchising. I think if the International Franchise Association would tell you that there's probably about 3000 franchise systems operating in the United States and they are in probably three or four hundred different industries. And so we each bring in that certain skill set to whatever we do. And what I've learned is that if you are not riding the right horse, you know, if that concept is not sound, if that concept doesn't have legs, if that concept is not going to resonate with the consumer or instead it's more of a fad or, you know, rather than a trend that has something really extensive behind it, then you know what? You can be no better than the concept that you write. And so if you're on a dead horse, you can sit there and beat it to death. And what is it doing? It's still sitting there. <laughs> And so I've always been very thoughtful about the concepts that I was willing to put my time into. And so I was recruited. This would have been in the uh, early part of 2016 um, that the, ch- the company was going through a series of challenges. I was brought in uh, specifically for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, they were looking for somebody who could really help them realign their relationship with their franchisees. Uh, we had just gone public in 2014. Uh, we had a management team in that was brought in not because of their franchise relationships, but because of their ability to open up a bunch of corporate units quickly. And they did. And so if you go look from our IPO in 2014, we did a secondary round in 2015. We raised about $30 million. And in 18 months, that executive team built or bought 61 corporate clinics. 
Remarkable achievement. This is my space. I'm telling you, anybody that goes from zero clinics to 61 clinics in 18 months is an extraordinary achievement, but it comes at a cost. And part of that cost was our franchise community, because when we went public, we had 242 franchised units in operation. And those franchisees, as they're watching this corporate growth expand, are not feeling the love. They're not feeling like, hey, wait a minute, weren't we the ones that brought you to the dance? <laughs> Where do we fit in this? And that they were feeling they weren't feeling the love. And so what a, one of the skill sets that I have is being able to manage a franchise system. A franchise system is built on the management of that incredibly important relationship between the franchisee and the franchisor. And so I was brought in to help facilitate or to improve those worsening relations. Uh, number two, those 61 corporate clinics that we had acquired, they came from two places. One, they were acquired from existing franchisees. And two, we were building them up from the ground. And what we found is those clinics that were acquired by the franchisees, they were operating okay. You know, they had an existing customer base, they had employees, they had doctors, they were okay. And the management required on that was very different from these green fields. And I'm, when I say Greenfield, just a de novo clinic built for the first time. And so we had built roughly 30 new Greenfields in the market, mainly in California, some in Arizona, and also in Chicago. And lo and behold, the challenge was these Greenfields were truly underperforming. And they were putting some pretty significant financial uh, pressure on the company. And so I was brought in to help turn around those corporate units. And they said, oh, by the way, look, at this is a part of our, our secession planning. You're coming in as a COO. We have a CEO. Uh, there's no discussion of that, that CEO leaving. But over time, it certainly would be appropriate for you to consider that. Now, I do my due diligence. I, I, I'm, I'm in that world of franchising. And what I did when I looked at this concept and thought it was amazingly sound. It was incredibly interesting. There was one challenge that I had with it when I look at this small box retail space. Now, when I say small box retail, all I'm talking about is that thousand square feet anchored by the supermarket where you get a haircut, buy a frozen yogurt, and now do chiropractic care. And this is where I spent most of my career, and I know that space really well. And if you think about it, all these little boxes are the same. They have the same customer base. They have the same landlord. They have the same rent rates. They have the, roughly the same build-out costs. And they're just different little products and services that each one of those boxes are offering. And so you, when I looked at this concept, there was some, it had some of the strongest unit economics I saw in that thousand square feet. Now I've seen stronger unit economics, but we're talking about just that little space and what, what are the options or the opportunities of that? And so it was a really interesting concept to me. The one challenge I saw and was also reflected in the, the fact of our own corporate units is the time it was taking to get to break even. And so what happens, and if you're going to be in this small box retail space, I'm just telling you right now, if your concept cannot break even in three, six to nine months, just as a system, you know, that you always have outliers, that you will fail. Why? Because your franchisees run out of money. Corporate runs out of money. <laughs> so you need a system that if you're in that small box retail space, that you've got that six to nine months to get to break even where you can really then move on to the next level. And so I could understand what the problem was and see a solution to it and uh, see, just find this amazing concept, which is why I ended up, you know, first being recruited and then accepted the position. We're going to dig into a lot of those different subjects that you that you just brought up because there was a lot in there. Um, but I'm going to pull a little bit on the uh, thread of you know you coming in and understanding how to you how to run a franchise system. And so um, to tell a little anecdote, we used to be a shareholder of a company that was one of the largest franchisees of a national fast food chain. And due to the royalties and the marketing fees, we came to realize over time that this company was essentially the nonprofit arm of the franchise or <laughs> it just was never profitable because of those royalties. And so I'm trying. And so you, you talk about understanding how to kind of create the win win um, relationship with franchisees. So how do you how do you go about making sure that your franchisees are healthy and are getting a big enough piece of the of the cumulative pie? Ben, it is such a question, a great question. And it is a core of franchising. 
And, and what I would tell you, and it doesn't matter what the franchise model is, if you really do have that franchisee in the center of your business model, and there's just so many things I love about franchising, and, 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 and just kind of back up a little bit. First of all, let's be very clear. Nobody understands franchising. There's, there's nothing intuitive about it. Just because you as a franchisee paid a franchise fee doesn't mean you know how to be a good franchisee. Just because you as a franchisor have that franchise disclosure document and you give it to a prospective franchisee doesn't mean you know how to be a franchisor. Absolutely not. There's nothing intuitive about the relationship of running a franchised business between a franchisee and a franchisor. Now, anybody can work it out. You know, we're not building a nuclear power plant here, but there are a couple of key elements that, boy, you better understand if you're going to be effective in running that business. Now, it has to start and end and begin with unit economics. It is just that simple. Now, they don't have to be perfect at the beginning because they're going to improve over time with any luck. But if you do not stay focused on the unit economics of that business, guess what happens? It fails. Over time, maybe shorter, maybe longer, but that unit economics is going to be essential. And let's be clear, franchising is not magic. Franchising isn't an automatic way of, succeed, of succeeding. There's some incredibly powerful attributes to the franchise model that if you under, understand how to tap into, can be remarkably successful, but there is many franchise systems that fail. And they fail very mature in their system. They fail very early in their system. They fail in the middle of their system. There's a lot of reasons for that failure. One of them could be what we talked about earlier, market. That if you are involved in a trend, in a fad, that turns out that you know it really didn't have much legs or that product or service got commoditized. And now all of a sudden, you're doing this specialty frozen yogurt concept and McDonald's just turns into a frozen yogurt uh, uh, in, their, in their soft serve when it really wasn't frozen yogurt. It was, it was ice milk with dead bacteria in it. But suddenly you have 12,000 new spigots between you and your franchisee or you and your customer. And so markets change, evolves, you know, all kinds of things change. But boy, stay focused on the unit economics of that business if you want to run a franchise system. And that's part of what you're talking about, is that if, if it's only good for the franchisor, how long does that last? If it's only good for the franchisee, how long does that last? If it's only good for the customer, but no one else can make a living from it, how long does that last? So this is the power of the franchise model is most times when it's working well, you have an alignment of interest with your customer, your franchisee, and the franchisor. Now, from time to time, you'll have differences of opinion. That's absolutely normal. But most times, you're all on the same side of the table. You want to provide a product or service that your, friend, your customer loves. You want a franchisee that loves what they're doing, is making a lot of money, which, of course, is then supporting the franchisor. So that's the first part of it, but that's where you have to stay focused. But even more importantly, is franchising is the business of managing the relationship because you're going to go through all kinds of challenges and that you, you know, and there are going to be good times and there's going to be bad times. And there are the effectiveness of managing this extraordinary relationship between the franchisee and the franchisor is basically creating your goodwill to survive the challenges that you're going to face as you build that business. And so if you don't understand that relationship, and I'm going to tell you the franchisee-franchisor relationship is the most unique relationship in business. They're not my employees. They're not a union. <laughs> they're, and they're, they're in, in this case, when the small box retail space, they're, they're people who have a passion for your product or service, who are willing to commit a significant portion of their resources to help you build your business. And it creates some really, really powerful relationships between those two entities. And if you unleash that on a concept that's sound, that isn't a fad, is more of a trend, the power that you are dealing with is remarkable, which is an example of so many of these really successful franchisors. Compounders is brought to you in partnership with Tegas. We created Compounders to uncover the lessons and frameworks of the best capital compounders in the world. And if you are a professional investor, VC, or operator, and you appreciate the deep research into the businesses explored on this podcast, check out tegas.co slash compounders. With Tegas, you can learn about any company directly from former execs, current customers, and industry experts, 
all of which are in position to offer unique insights into company's growth, its customer value, and its competition. What makes Tegas different is that you don't have to lead your own expert calls. The platform offers instant access to the world's largest collection of investor-led call transcripts on companies such as Compounders, Guests, Viasat, Element Solutions, and Avid Technology. All you have to do is log in and you'll get instant access to nearly 25,000 expert call transcripts. And the best part, the Tegas collection grows larger with each investor and company that joins. Still want to do your own expert calls? Tegas is the right solution. Experts that are just as good or better than what you'd find on other networks, but starting at just $300 per call, not the $1,000 or more others charge. If you're ready to go deeper on the next compounding business, head to tegas.co slash compounders for a free trial. I can personally say that having access to the Tegas platform and Rolodex of experts has fundamentally changed the quality of due diligence Coast Street does on both new and existing ideas. And we're going to get into uh, questions about profitability because I do want to hear a little more about the unit economics. But let's let's take a step back. and, And I think listeners would really be interested in hearing a little bit about the demand drivers that you think are tailwinds for this company. So specifically, let's talk about what's been propelling the joint's growth and what you think from a macro kind of um, perspective will continue to be a tailwind in the future. Ben, it's the right question. Because again, it's back to concept. How sound is it? What's its opportunity? How does it look going forward? And if we look at chiropractic in this country, it's basically been an industry that's been stigmatized and not understood. I'm a baby boomer. Uh, baby boomers grew up with this idea that, you know what, this chiropractic care is kind of quackery. It's not, it's voodoo medicine. It's not really true medical services. And that, and then it's, and it's, and then where do I find it? Oh, it's, it's in medical facilities. It's in office buildings up on the nth floor. And that, you know, because why? Because you can't afford any other kind of real, uh, you know, your real estate costs. And, and so nobody knows about it. Now, chiropractic care has been around for 125 years. We're doing nothing different as it relates to chiropractic care. Our revolution is that we are actually revolutionizing access to chiropractic care. So by taking chiropractic care, putting it in that retail setting, making it affordable, making it accessible, making it without insurance, without an appointment. So you're sitting there in your daily use center where you get your groceries and buy a frozen yogurt and get a haircut. And oh, there's the joint. That's not cannabis. That's chiropractic. I'll go in. <laughs> and they do. And so this is what we've done is by putting this in that accessible place, people are trialing their work. It's working for them and more and more are coming in. So if you look at the industry of of chiropractic, it's about an $18 billion industry. It's dominated by the 41,000 independent practitioners. And that if you look at, and and, and mainly insurance-based model. And so if you come to the joint and in the middle of the pandemic, when you look at 2020, we had almost a half a million people open the door to the, for the very first time to the joint. Now, that's a pretty amazing number. And that was on a base of 579 clinics that when we closed out the year of 2020, what was to me most exciting about that number is 27% of them had never seen a chiropractor before. This is, this is where your market is. It's not just, okay, you have an existing customer that I'm, I, I ran out of insurance or I don't like my doctor. We are creating market by making that affordable, by making it accessible. If you look at the American population, roughly 50% of the American people don't even know what the word chiropractor means. You have about 30% that are scared. You know, is this bone crunching or back breaking? And oh, don't touch my neck. And that they, with a story, with an understanding, with overcoming that fear, reducing the friction, they can trial, which is, of course, exactly what we do. And then you have 16% of the American people who actually have used chiropractic, or adults, who have used chiropractic in the last 12 months. So when you think of markup, good Lord, where does that go? What happens when it's not 16%, it's 18%, 19%, 22%, and it's primarily being driven by providing access in that retail setting where where, where they can have trial and this company's you know kind of been an unabashed proponent of chiropractic care as an underutilized treatment um, for afflictions such as chronic pain 
So as an industry leader, how do you, what's your role in breaking this, the, the stigma or, you know, just making people more comfortable in general? Is it all about access or are there other things you can do as well to, to get the message out there? Well, it's, a, it's really, it's, it's about educating the consumer about the power and efficacy of chiropractic care. And that really is one of our vision statements is that it's not just simply running a series of corporate clinics or a company or a franchise clinics that are delivering chiropractic care. It's truly educating the consumer about the power and efficacy of chiropractic. And one of the most powerful tools we have to do that is try it. You know, trial, come in, make it simple, make it easy, make it affordable, make it where I can, you know, I, I, I'm not risking anything to open that door and see if this helps me with my, my pain. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at the traditional chiropractic market or those 41,000 independent practitioners out there, it's predominantly insurance-based. Uh, the demographics is predominantly women and that it's, uh, it definitely skews older. Now, if you look at what's our demographics, 44% of our patients are millennial, 11% are Gen Z. The growth that we're experiencing is in those in, in millennial and younger. It's not the baby boomers. We have baby boomers like myself. I've been going to chiropractor for 30 years. That's not why I have the job, but it's given me a perspective from the point of view of a patient. But it's not baby boomers. And the millennials don't have that stigma. They're, they are looking for more natural, holistic ways to get out of pain. They want to try to avoid the opioids. They want to try to avoid the surgery. And so if this can help, and it's $29 to step in there and see if somebody can help me address my back pain, which is a $134 billion industry in this country, then you know what? Wow. This is interesting. And so this is built into our mission. Our mission is to improve quality of life through affordable chiropractic care. And so that is the power of this model is educating that consumer to trial, it works, they tell their friends, they come back again. And that's why what, what, what the real, I think, opportunity is as we look forward. And there's just so many different directions we can go. But since we talked a bunch about profitability and, and, and the productivity of the box, let's get into that. So me, for me, as a, someone who's spent a lot of time looking at retail companies, I mean, the most, impe- the most important metric for me is always sales per square foot. And the retailers with the most productive boxes often generate the best returns on capital. So maybe will you talk to, to, to the listeners about where the joint stores sit in terms of sales per square foot and the productivity of these thousand square foot boxes? Yeah, and, and, and it's an interesting question to think about sales, sales per square foot and certainly uh, so many retail concepts to do that, and especially a grocery store that just lives and dies by a couple percent margin. And so if I have more prepared carrots that I can charge, you know, this upcharge on versus a whole carrot in the, in the produce section, I mean, it really, it, it's essential. Now here, because this is 100% service, we have no product. And so I, it's, I, I don't really think very much about sales per square foot. The average clinic is around 1,000 square feet. You know, it can be smaller, it can be larger, but that's kind of the, the, the goal. And that's where in those spaces, that's typically what they are, maybe 1,200 square feet. And so how we measure it is we're looking at really billings per month. So what's your sales per month? That's the way we really evaluate that. And I guess you could do the, the math and divide it by the number of square feet that you have. But what we know is that around twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars in monthly sales is a, is kind of the, that that break-even point. And then you can have one wellness coordinator and one doctor. You'll have a full-time equivalent because obviously we're open more than forty hours. But they can run that clinic up to about that twenty-five, thirty thousand uh, dollars in, in monthly sales. And, and when you're looking, again, especially the small box retail, it's not a complicated space. There's five costs that you have to manage. And this is what you should be paying attention to. One, your lease. Okay, you're going to sign it. It's a five-year plus maybe, and it's fixed. And so it will go up maybe, and you've got your cam. But it's, that is going to be one of the products, one of the costs you have to manage. And you better get it right when you sign it <laughs> because you're stuck with it for the next five years or 10. Number two, employees. I mean, your labor. I mean, you, you've got to manage your labor. Uh, and that's going to be a significant portion. That will be our number one cost in a clinic of the joint will be our labor. And that kind of makes sense. It's not just a 16-year-old girl delivering frozen yogurt. It's a medical doctor who's providing chiropractic services. Number three, marketing. You, in small box retail, your customer base is fixed. It's, five, it's anyone working, traveling, or living within that five to 15-minute radius around that little box. 
And that is it. So just ask yourself, how far do you go for a haircut? How far do you go to get you pick up your laundry? How far, how far will you go to send a package? I can tell you three to five, th- th- uh, five to 15 minutes and 15 minutes is a long time. So that local store marketing becomes an essential cost associated with that. The next cost that all those little boxes have is cost of goods. And that's, again, really critical. So when I'm in frozen yogurt, I know that I've got to ideally run a 28% cost of goods. I know that when that cost of goods starts running up and all of a sudden those, those, my employees are giving it to their friends and family and it's going out the back door, my cost of goods goes way up and something's got to be done. And so if you're in the fast food and you, you, let's say some of the sandwich, I'm there, this, they're going to run a little bit higher, maybe 32, 33% ideally. But you let that cost of goods get out of, get out of line. Just think about that piece of the pie of your revenue that, you're, that, that you are mismanaging. And then that final fifth piece is going to be just all the ancillary stuff. You know, your insurance, your, your permitting, your, your internet, all that kind of, whatever else you have. Just the, just the normal business stuff. Now, in the joint model, we only have four of the five. We have no cost of goods. And, and that, so what does that do? Just think about it. If the average, is say, is 30% of cost is out of my model. So look at the flexibility that gives me. When you think about a Starbucks, for example, in the very early years, now it's changed a lot, but when Starbucks first opened up and was truly that drip coffee concept, you know what their cost of goods were? Less than 10%. And it was mainly paper. What's coffee? Coffee is a bunch of water with some little grounds in it. And it was, and it was, and it created a platform that they could obviously grow to the, to where they are today. It's evolved over time, but managing that cost of goods is such an essential port, part of that small box retail space. And so then when we're back to the unit economics of it, that's really what you're looking at. What are those costs? What's that potential revenue? And I would say that these are some of the strongest unit economics that I've seen. So what we see is that mature clinic is probably running around 30% uh, uh, EBITDA or free cash flow. And as a, on an average system, and that's that's a in, in that space, those are remarkable numbers. And, and one thing that I've watched many times in my career is that productivity, whatever however measured sales, sales per square foot or, or bookings per day, that drops materially as more and more stores are open because you start cannibalizing yourself to some degree. Um, how do you how do you be careful not to let that happen and not get to a point where you're adding so many stores where, you know, you're just, there's a little bit of an overlap here and you're, you're, you're siphoning off, you know, those people within three minutes, you know, who were, were within 15 minutes and now there's a closer one. And all of a sudden they're going to a different place. And then, you know, it kind of impacts the profitability of the whole system. Yeah. And, and the, one of the tools that we have, and this is a big issue for any, any growing system, you know, and if it's all corporate owned, it doesn't matter because it's all going back to the same pocket. So you don't, have, you don't have that conflict if I have two corporate units next to each other. And this is really the Starbucks model is that, you know, they, they never really franchise. They're doing a little bit of franchising today, but they are virtually an entire corporate union model. That, you know, Howard Schultz, that was really his, what, he didn't really believe in franchising. So he could set his, his little coffee shops next to each other and it didn't matter as long as the market would support it. And so in, in, in our case, because again, this isn't frozen yogurt, this is that medical service, I have so much information about every single patient that I have. I know where they live, I know where they work, I know when they come in, I know what that happens to them when they come in. And so that we have a database when we're looking at sites and that we will run a customer database on every clinic in that area and we can see where they're drawn from. I can tell if you're going to that clinic on your way from work or from home. I mean, it's just crazy the data that we have. And so that we can look at and and predict the cannibalization, because that's really what you're talking about, that if we put this clinic here, how much of that patient base will be cannibalized into the new clinic versus the new market that we can increase? And and the level of information is so deep that we have almost just remarkably accuracy at predicting the cannibalization between those units. Now, the other thing that we're finding is because this isn't a fixed pie, we're creating market. We talked about that. 27% of my patients are new to chiropractic. So every time I open a clinic, I'm opening market, which is allowing me to further dense pack these units. And so you're managing this with the information that you're packing. I have franchisees who are cannibalizing themselves. 
because they have their protected territory. We offer protected territory. Their, uh, their cells are running $100,000 a month. They can put a clinic in their same territory, maybe a mile away. And then, okay, initially they'll see a drop, but then they're going to pick up $60,000, $80,000 in the new clinic. The first clinic was at maybe at 100, dropped to 80, came back up to 90. They almost doubled the cells in the protected territory they had. And we're seeing more and more cannibalization. And, and what the, the concern that you're really focused on is number one, when competition further enhances it because we're all we're, we're, we're creating competitors ourselves. And number two, if you have a market that's, that's uh, either flat or diminishing, and then that's when you start getting that real pressure of, okay, how many units out there serving how many people? Getting to competition and the potential number of total units. I always joke when you see a retailer say that they have a thousand possible locations, it's probably 500 <laughs> and that they're not, they're not sufficiently incorporating competitive openings. And, and, you know, there's always this, like, let's sell people on more on a lot of stores to hope their stock goes up. So how do you, as you think about that model that you're describing and where you're, where you're trying to forecast where you can put clinics, how do you build in competitive openings and how do you assess, you know, uh, and how do you put conservatism into the process to make sure that you're not ending up whatever, three years from now with, with, with 10 or 15% too many stores that you have to, to roll back? Well, then you have to be constantly aware of your market, uh, as we talked about, is that, that you know, if you look, and again, there's in, in retail, there's really two metrics that you focus on if you really want to understand retail performance of a chain. And it's not complicated. What is it? It's comps. It's same store sales. Same store sales is one of the most powerful tools or one of the most powerful metrics you have to understand what's going on with that business. Is it flat? Is it shrinking? Is it growing? All we're saying, okay, I want to measure what is the sales of this business compared to a year ago, same period. And that if, 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 so if I'm evaluating any retail concept, I look there. If you come back to the joint, okay, let's talk about comps. Now, pre-COVID pandemic, from 2016 to 2019, so that's a four-year, if I take my comps, four-year stacked comps, it was 99%. Now, that's quarter, that's 25% year over year over year. Let's go to the pandemic. In the pandemic, where, of course, we all had challenges and trying to figure out how we're going to respond, will we be affected, and a lot of companies were obviously enormously affected by the pandemic. We were not. We, you know, we were essential service. We stayed open. Our doctors continued to serve. The biggest metric that we got hit by was new patients, but our existing patients truly saw this as essential to their health. So for the full year of 2020, our comps were 9%. Now, when we come into 21, okay, what's going on? Okay, 21, uh, Q1, when we announced our comps, it was 21%. Q2, which was the nadir of the pandemic, so it's kind of a little bit of a skewed number, our comps for any clinic open more than 13 months compared to a year ago was 53%. We just released Q3 comps and it was 27%. So that's telling you that, and, and I'll tell you that that's organic growth. We haven't changed pricing. So that's more patients opening the door. That's existing patients using us more often. So that's a pretty powerful indicator of what's going on with your capacity to grow. And because that's really what we're talking about. How dense can I make these? The other side that you want to pay attention to, and that's really volume. Is that what's going on with the gross sales of the system? So last year, our system-wide sales were about $260 million. We just talked at the end of Q3, and our, our gross sales for the system was uh, just a share under $260 million, million in nine months. So it shows you we've been continually growing this business, gross sales for any clinic open for any period of time. We've been experiencing 33 34 37% gross sales growth year over year over year. Again, giving you confidence because you're monitoring the market, seeing is it growing, is it shrinking? Can I put more clinics in? Should I be pulling back? As it relates to the competition, the key is growth and get there in those best sites before they do. And so that's why you have this, this aggression to get this system grown. What I also know, if you take the step back, what are we doing here? This is really a brand building exercise in that small box retail space. And the most powerful tool I have to build that brand is my storefronts. Now, we've come out and said we want 1,000 units open by the end of 2023. And, that, and we're not saying, okay, it's 1,000, but we really get to 500. <laughs> you know, we're, we are committed to getting those 1,000 units open. And we came out and made that statement in January of 2020, pre-pandemic. 
And we could have at any point said, you know, the pandemic, it slowed things down. We really need to give ourselves a little bit more time. It's not going to be quite 2023, but maybe into 2024. We didn't. We reaffirmed that based on everything we can see with the business, with the growth pattern we're experiencing, with the growth of our franchise, with the growth of our growth sales, with the comps we're experiencing, we will get to 1,000 units by the end of 2023. And we are on track to do that. And that, that's just the beginning. We also talk about looking at our demographic ba- and database of who our patient is and the psychographic d- database and then trying to match that across the country. How many points of distribution can replicate our current footprint? We already know there's over 1,800 points of distribution that we could put a joint clinic on, assuming the market doesn't even grow. So again, you see this remarkable opportunity in front of us as people are more and more discovering the power and efficacy of chiropractic care. You seem to be a student of retail and franchising. We've talked a little bit about the Starbucks model and you have personal experience at at Tasty Delight. I'm wondering if there are any mistakes that other higher growth franchise companies have made that you're trying to avoid. Any, Any pitfalls and things that you're looking at that you could say, look, these guys were growing really fast, had huge targets for how many stores, and then, you know, all of a sudden, poof! You know, it's not—it's not even relevant anymore. What, what do you? What, what do you? What do you think of when I bring that up? Well, I think of you know what franchising is actually the business of selling mistakes. <laughs> if you really think about it, I mean, what are you telling that franchisee? Look, I'm, I'm giving you an operating model. I'm telling you how to run this business. Don't do this. Do that. Well, how did I figure that out? I did that and it was so horrible. I said, oh my gosh, I'll never do that again. Or I did something else and that worked really well. So I'll do more of that. And so truly it's kind of interesting. It's out of that experience that we gain. Is, and where is that experience most relevant is in our mistakes, in the problems and the challenges. That's where all the learning of life takes place. The difference in a franchise model is you're leveraging that learning so that you can minimize those mistakes. You'll still make mistakes. Let's be very, very clear. If you're not making mistakes right now, you're dead. Because that you're, you're not growing, you're not moving, you're not pushing, you know, that you're not following the market. You're not, you, you, you have to make mistakes and then you, and you can learn from others. And that's why you should be very active in the International Franchise Association. Because guess what? I'm not the only franchisor out here in retail trying to build a business. And it turns out if you're building a franchise system, what you've constantly got to keep into mind is that we are managing two parallel unrelated businesses. Concept, chiropractic care, frozen yogurt, postal and business and communication services, hot dogs, you know, you know, donuts, whatever. Methodology. And the methodology of franchising is actually concept agnostic. It doesn't matter. And so I can go to the, uh, uh, the National Conference for Franchising and see other companies, how they're handling the transfer of their technology to their franchisees. How are they handling marketing? We, we're, we have the same database or the customer base if we're all in that small box retail space. And what are they doing to reach out to that person? What are, how are they focused on their digital marketing? How are they doing better? Why are they doing something I'm not doing? has nothing to do with concept. How are they more attracting a better quality franchisee? So those learnings, so yes, I am learning all the time. Believe me, we do not have it figured out. We're continuing to make our mistakes. We don't make the same mistake often, more than once or twice. And what we're doing is in our overall system, capturing those best practices. Sometimes that means mistakes, bringing it back into the network, teaching it across the whole system and all boats rise. Again, one of the powers of the franchise model if you're doing it effectively. One of the major attractions of being a franchisor, I think is, is, is having a capital light business model where you're not physically building stores. But this company, you know, has, has traditionally and historically bought franchisees. So what is what is a rationale for that? I mean, wouldn't you rather just be as capital light as possible and and own, you know, one corporate store in Indiana that you can try things on and, and, and that's it? Well, there's no question that the power of the franchise model is it's capital light because you're leveraging capital. You know, what you're saying to that franchisee is, listen, you pay me the franchise fee, you pay for the build out, you pay for the time even most of us charge a royalty. So you pay me all that. I'll take that top line. We'll all grow faster. And especially if you're building a brand in that small box retail space, that's a super way to accelerate the growth and build your brand and everybody wins. So that, that's that's a very, very positive way to, to accelerate growth. Now, there are a number of franchisors that would not have a corporate unit if their life depended on it. 
because they can't run it. And why? why? Because the margins are so thin that if you're not a franchisee, putting your little heart and soul into that concept, then you cannot make it work. Now, my experience in most franchise systems, and I don't care if we're talking about McDonald's or otherwise, is that corporate, that corporate units underperform about 20% to a franchise unit. Why? It's called vested interest. I mean, I can have a corporate employee, I can give them a bonus, I can try to incentivize them to be a better employee. It's hard. And, and anybody can run one clinic. A corporate can run a clinic, a franchisee can run a clinic. We're talking about systems. So in that system of franchisees, when they have a vested interest, when suddenly it's actually their financial wherewithal that's on the line to make it work, they can do things in runways that you could never incentivize on a corporate level. So of course we see that higher performance in the franchise system compared to a corporate portfolio. And so if you don't have that 20% margin, and so for example, I spent a lot of time at the mailbox, et cetera, incredible concept, really powerful, now the UPS store. Well, I can tell you the margins, especially in the early years of that concept were so narrow. There was no way corporate would ever be, you know, taking on a portfolio of, of corporate units. In fact, they did go public. They were founded in 1980, went public in 1986. And their idea was not to open up a portfolio of corporate units. <laughs> their idea was to reinvest that money in the acceleration of their franchise businesses, which they did. In this case, because these unit economics are so strong, the reason that we have right now, you know, today, 88 corporate units in our, compared to our overall portfolio of 666 units is that they are so profitable. And if you actually look at the, 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 the performance of our corporate units, and this is new for me in, in, in any franchise I've been a part of, is our corporate units are actually either performing to par or better than our franchisees. And I've never experienced that. And so when you look at that, that becomes a compelling reason, which was actually the purpose of the IPO was to add a portfolio of corporate units to the system just because they were so darn profitable. And so that's the rationale is why do we kind of skip a little bit away from that capital light 100% franchise model is just because those corporate units are so profitable that it's worthwhile for us to continue to add that as a portion of our portfolio. And when it comes to accelerating the growth of the franchise base, you know, this company has decided to rely on regional developers to help with growth. Can you talk about that strategy, why you think it makes sense? And are there any downsides to using regional developers to, to help you accelerate your, your growth? Yes, there are, there are downsides. And I'd say there's downsides to everything. There's upsides to everything. You just got to manage it, which is, is it more up or is it down? Um, and if you look at the regional developer model, I've worked with it a lot. And that if you look at those roughly 3,000 franchisors in the United States, United States today, I'd say 25, 30% of them actually use that regional developer model <clears throat> where you're actually granting a territory, you're doing a revenue split. I mean, there's a lot of multi-units that's called regional developer, but that's not what we're really talking about. Regional mod, to me, when we say regional developer, you are you know, granting that trade area or that, that protected territory to that regional developer, you're incentivizing them to open and help you open up the clinics or units and that you're doing a revenue share with them. So like in our case, we, with our regional developers, we'll give them 50% of the initial franchise fee that's collected and that we will share with them 3% of the 7% royalty that we collect. Now that's not an annuity, that, they have to work for that. They have to help us in the site selection, they have to help us in getting the clinic open, they have to help us in the ongoing support, they have to help us in the overall training. So there's work to be done for that 3%. And what I would tell you is that if you have a complex business model, you can't touch a regional developer program because when you put that third party between you, the franchisor and the franchisee, so much gets lost in translation that it fails. So a lot of these quick service restaurants, for example, that are highly complex operations, you'll never see them even consider a regional development model. But if you're looking at a, a concept like frozen yogurt or chiropractic care, which is a really simple model, or a mailbox, et cetera, a UPS store, because of the, the simplicity of that model, 
that RD can in fact accelerate your growth with a speed that's beyond. And the whole idea of franchising is speed. So you, you know, if I have somebody leveraging their capital of franchisees, building that unit more than taking my resources to build that same unit, you know how much, how longer that would take out of the profits to get to that point where I'm now increasing my corporate portfolio versus just selling a bunch of franchises. So I definitely can speed. You know, it, it can accelerate your time to market. And this is all about a brand building exercise. How do I get you to open the door? It's not my $75 million to get you to change your toothpaste. I'm not Procter & Gamble. I have a storefront that you, you stumble into. And then, oh, yeah, I'll try that. That works. And so that's what's really important. Now, the downside is if you don't know how to run a regional developer system, you will get the worst of both worlds. You just gave away a significant portion of your revenue, and you're not getting the development that justifies the revenue split. And so you better be able to manage it. Now, for an early franchisor, the RD may be a quick pop of cash when they need it. And if you're a starting franchisor, let's be clear, it's a race of capital versus time. You need to get to a point where you have critical mass that you can turn around and clean up the mess you made to get to where you are at that point. And the only thing you have is franchise sales. It's not your royalty. It's still growing. And so that the RD model is, is, is a complexity, but if you know how to do it, it can be an extraordinary accelerator of growth. And you're certainly seeing that here at the joint today. 80% of our sales are coming from our regional developers. And that of course translates into the open units. And so that they have done an outstanding job of helping us to accelerate the growth. So I don't have 21 salespeople on commission I have 21 RDs out there helping me sell franchises, helping me get sites selected, helping me get clinics open, helping me get franchisees trained, helping me provide that ongoing support. And just look at how I can leverage my overhead without having to pay that directly if that was all a direct surge from the corporate office. And you've talked a lot about the profitability, both of the, of the franchise stores and the, and the corporate stores. Some of the large franchisors that are in public companies have EBITDA margins that creep into the mid 30% range. What is your view of how profitability should progress over time at the joint as you continue to grow the franchise base? And maybe just layer in some conversation about how the regional developer model you know, impacts overall margins over time. Oh, it definitely does. Because again, if you look at our line, our cost of goods is, you know, the biggest piece in our cost of goods, like I said, I don't have a cost of goods, but in our cost of goods, that's the three, the majority of that expense line is the royalty that I pay our regional developers. And in a franchise system, what you'd expect is over time that you should see an increasing margin improvement because look at you, how many CEOs do you need? You know, how many VPs of sales do I need? How many VP of operations do I need? Well, I need only one of each of those. Now, as the system grows, I'm gonna put some more people out in the field to support. And so, yes, there's, there's additional support that I'll be able to, that I'm gonna always be putting in place to support the growth of my franchise system. But it's, it's so much more leverageable because that you, you know, you're really leveraging off that core. And of course, that's going to get more effective over time. So you should see a margin improvement over time in a typical franchise system. Now, in our case, is that where you can really impact that margin is, of course, you're buying back those regional developers. They've done their job. They've developed that market. And you look back and you say, you know what? I can actually support that cheaper than the 3% that I'm paying them. And typically they're looking for a way to monetize the investment that they created. And so that there's a very natural progression in franchising that over time, the franchisor will go turn around and buy back those RDs. Sometimes you can make a requirement in the, in the agreement itself. Sometimes it's open. So it's really just a conversation between the two parties coming to an agreement if they can. If I look again, where I spent a lot of time in the mailbox, et cetera model, at one point they had 120 RDs, uh, regional developer territories in place. I think today I was talking to a friend a couple months ago and I think they're down to about 20. And I think that's a very natural progression. And every time you buy back that RD, you're buying back margin. And we haven't talked at all about culture, but culture is a really important subject of this podcast. So I'm interested, what you know, the, the company was facing some challenges, and, and as we were talking about before we got on uh, on air, then you know that the stock price was was really low when you when you accepted the co the the temporary CEO role. Um, so what what was the state of the culture when when you arrived, and and how how do you think it has evolved over time? What a great question. Um, the state of the culture when I arrived, um, the best I could say is grim. 
that uh, it was tough. I mean, there were, there were a lot of challenges is that, you know, I came on board in, in May of, of, of 2016. I, I told you that earlier that, you know, the, the part of this idea of me coming on board was a, a succession planning. So you're looking, what, two, three years? Well, in that first couple of months, our first couple of weeks, uh, my CFO resigned. Uh, the CEO is gone. There's an entire clean sweep of the C-suite. That, and over the course of the next couple of months, that I lost my VP of operations, I lost my VP of sales and the entire sales team, but two people. I lost my IT team besides one developer, my training team, uh, my, and that, uh, a couple other people. And as each one of them were going out the door, they all kept telling me it's not about me. And that, uh, <laughs> and that when I arrived in this organization, the average tenure, there's probably about 30 people in the corporate office at that point. And the average tenure in that corporate office is nine months. There's no institutional memory. There's, 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 I mean, just imagine, you know, the, the cost to an organization to have that high of turnover. And, and so what I would say to you, and, and you, and, and Ben, you hit the right word culture, because that, I mean, we work for people. And, and as, as my mother-in-law said very clearly in my marriage is that at the very beginning is that I've been married 38 years that uh, the fish stinks from the head down. <laughs> so it doesn't get much better than that. And so it's you, you have to be uh, so focused on culture if you're going to run a successful company, at least from my perspective. And that, so when, when you look at that and you can see all these people changing on one hand, if you can survive it, it is the greatest gift that you could have, because how do you change culture? How do you change people's minds? How do you change people's attitudes? Painfully and slowly, unless they leave. <laughs> and then I, you look at certain people and say, okay, you know that they're maybe not the best for that position, but you know what, they're what I've got. You know, so I'm gonna have to work with this and I'm gonna try to inculcate this group of what I believe is appropriate culture to focus on as a franchise system. But when everybody's going, you're starting fresh. All you have to do is survive. And so, if, so I was able to attract some incredibly talented people who could see beyond the challenges that we're facing at the moment. They could believe in the future that we're laying out. And this is why you want to be a part of this organization. And they're staying with me today. And, and so that we were able to overcome that challenge, build a culture, reconnect with our franchise community, and, uh, and the results were, of course, to the benefit of our shareholders. One thing I've thought a lot about um, when it comes to public companies is that there's a big difference between being a $25 million market cap company and a $1.5 billion market cap company and a company that goes from that, you know, from 25 to over a billion, um, you know, inevitably has to grow up in certain ways right because it's just you, there's just different expectations and infrastructure maybe talk a little bit about ways in which you think this company has you know quote unquote grown up since 2016 from an operational maybe reporting you know sarbanes oxley anything that you think in any ways that you think the companies has progressed and grown up no across the board and i would say it starts with our board is that if you, you know, if you look at our board, there's been some evolution on that board. And today we have an incredibly sophisticated group of board members, starting with our lead director, uh, Matt Rubel, who's, you know, been a CEO of billion dollar companies, been a board of billion dollar companies. Uh, one of our, what originally was one of our largest shareholders who ended up closing down their fund, but he loved the concept so much that he uh, an incredibly sophisticated investor and, and retailer. Is, uh, Glenn Crevlin is another person on our board. And I can go through that. Jim Amos, who uh, has a history of, of, of managing franchise systems across this country. So I would say that one of the things that, uh, that evolution took place is fairly quickly, we had a pretty uh, sophisticated group of very mature board members, way beyond what you would expect to see in a little $25 million cap company. But they could see the opportunity and they continually forced me to think about not where we are today, but how do we look down the road? We wanna be a billion dollar company. How does that look? And so putting some of the disciplines that you'd expect from a reporting procedure, from a process procedure, from you know, you know, just taking, making sure that you have like a Sarbanes-Soxley's issue or you know, our 4.4B 
all these issues we're 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 an accelerated filer now so that we we are you know complying with uh, the 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 SOX 404b and all these things force you to mature to a level that you typically wouldn't just on your own and so i would say it really started with our board in terms of really being focused on not being where you are but where you're trying to be and then that translates as we build a business. And so we're again, trying to draw in the highest quality talent that we can afford, not for our need today, but where we think they can take us tomorrow. So you, I know it's because in the end of the day, Ben, everything is done by people. You know, we're not a factory here. That, that it's our chiropractors delivering chiropractic service. It's people helping this franchise system grow. It's board giving counsel and advice so that we can be more effective in running this business. And that's exactly what you're looking for from your board is don't tell me where we are today, help me be better for tomorrow. This company um, was recently the subject of a short report and I'm not interested in going through the details of the report's claims. I'm always more interested in leadership. So I'm curious how you approach communicating with your employees and investors and any of your stakeholders you know, when you see, you know, a piece of negativity out there about the company, what, what was your strategy there? Well, you're right. I mean, this is actually the second time that we've had short reports written about us. Um, and as you read through those reports, um, there's obviously not a lot, of, obvious to me anyway, <laughs> there, there's not a lot of substance behind the, the, the claims raised. And, and quite frankly, as I read through those reports, you know what I see? I see somebody who wrote them that doesn't understand the franchise model. Um, and, and so you draw conclusions based on a, a, a lack of understanding of the franchise model itself. And, and you know, we can kind of leave it at that. And there's, like, you're right. I, there's no need to go through, uh, you, know, you know, the line by line of where I felt they didn't understand fully the way a franchise model works. But the key to all of this is, is, is communication. Is, is that, and, and you're right, when that report came out, that uh, we have a very open relationship with our, with our major investors. We're talking to them quite regularly. I, I'm very easy to get a hold of. And so when that report came out, they, they, they could read through it and say, you know, I don't really think this is true, but, you know, I'd really like to hear it right from the horse's mouth. <laughs> and so immediately I got calls from our sales side analysts, which we again have strong relationships with our major shareholders who said, okay, just reaffirm for me. I'm like, I don't quite understand this one. What's your response on that? And so that we were able to immediately communicate with our major shareholders, with our sales side analysts and help them understand the, you know, the reality of, of, of these, these points that were being made about the company or these negative comments that are being made about the company. You have the same conversation with your franchise community that uh, I don't think I'm served by going out there and directly confronting or saying, you know, talking to a bear report about why they think what they wrote, I don't believe is the truth. I have to tell you my senses, and I may be wrong, that they're really not interested in the truth. (laughs) It's more a point of view that they're trying to drive. And that um, it's so it's, it's, you're not going to, if somebody wants to write something bad about you, you're not going to be able to stop them. You don't have the words to convince. And ultimately, Ben, what what is, and I've said this all the time to everybody, is you know what? Performance is my greatest protection. We just didn't have one good quarter. Go back quarter by quarter by quarter by quarter for the last five and a half years and see what this company's done. See how we've operated. Listen to what we've said. And look, if we said what we said we're going to do, And what you'll find is quarter after quarter after quarter, we have continued to do what we say, say what we do, and perform at a high level. And getting to that success, the stock has seen just an incredible rise over the last five years, going from under $3 in 2016 to close to 100 today. And you talk about consistency, but what would you say the key elements of that success that this company and the stock has had? Well, it's, it's back to the, the, the conversation we just had. It, it's about performance. It's about setting expectations. It's about making, I mean, again, you know, it's so yeah, everybody, especially everybody wants to go out there with good news, right? And, 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 and talk to the best side of it. And, and, you know, most times does it happen or if you're half the time it happens. And so 
you have to establish yourself with a reputation of that my word is what we do. You know, there's an, what, you know what integrity is? The words I say and the actions I take are in alignment. That's all. And, and so when you, when you build a reputation of integrity, so you talk about when things aren't right, because yes, we've had, we've had problems, we've had all kinds of challenges. That you're, you're, you can't build a business without the challenges that, that you're going to have to confront on a daily basis. The question is just how do you do it? And then what are the results of whatever actions you're taking? So that's what's the most interesting part. But what you have to do is continually build on that reputation of integrity. And it all starts, though, with a concept that has legs. If this horse was dead, it doesn't matter my integrity. <laughs> you know, it's just not going anywhere. You, know, you can't make up these comps. You can't make up these franchise sales. You can't make up this, you know, the, the, the revenue growth that we're experiencing, the EBITDA performance that we're experiencing. So, you, you, so that these are hard numbers that give people comfort that this is the beginning of this relationship with this company, not the end. And that's really, the, to me, the interesting transition that we've gone through in that period of these last five and a half years, because without question, five and a half years ago, we were a value stock, <laughs> you know, that, that you bought into this business because you thought, you know what, these guys, maybe they'll, they'll pull it off, maybe they won't, but it feels like they're undervalued. This seems like an investment worth making. And as we continue to perform and the stock price goes up, that you quickly move, not, well, we very quickly moved, not everybody moves that quickly, but you move from that, that perspective of value to growth. And so if you have somebody today buying in at $100 a share, they didn't do it because of the value. They did it because if they see the future we're laying out, the opportunity in front of this company, the management team behind it, the growth of the franchise system, the opportunity of the market, and say, you know what? There's still, there's still some, some, some juice here. <laughs> this is, there's still some interesting piece to this story that I want to be a part of. And with, um, with all that success, of course, comes rising expectations of, of growth and profitability. So what do you think, what are three or four things this company absolutely has to get right for the stock to continue to be a good investment for our shareholders? Well, I, the way I'd answer that is this, this is such a simple model. There's nothing complicated about it. We're not building a nuclear power plant here. We're providing chiropractic service in a retail setting in a market that's only expanding. So the number one thing, absolutely, set everything else aside, I have got to grow. If, the, if my growth isn't that there, then you know what's going to happen. And that's why we're saying we believe we can get to 1,000 units at the end of the 2023. We know that there's room for 1,800 based on current use. And we know that this is the beginning of this journey, not the end. There's 41,000 independent practitioners out there. We have less than 2% market share of that $18 billion business, which we're only increasing the size of the business. So if the growth isn't there, then this whole thing falls apart. And that growth is measured in multiple ways. And certainly it starts with, with, this, with the clinic count, you know, getting more clinics out there, taking over more market share, educating consumers about the power and efficacy of chiropractic. The other thing that we absolutely have to get right is the retention, the recruitment, and the retention of our doctors. Again, simple model. Our doctors are the heart of this business. And that we need to make sure that we're creating an environment, whether they are the franchisee, and about 25% of our franchises are, in fact, the doctor of chiropractic, or whether they're the doctor hired by the franchisee who's a non-doctor. We have got to be continually focused on creating an environment where they feel that this is where they want to be and where they want to stay. And if we don't get that right, then you know what? Again, <laughs> the, the, the apple cart falls apart. Uh, the third thing that I know we have to get right is technology. That we have an initial, uh, when I first got here, we had a, a, a homegrown IT platform that really runs our company that this, com this platform houses all of our electronic patient records. You can go to any clinic across the nation and pop in and give them, scan a card or give them your name and they will, you, they, your records will be pulled up. Your doctor will see your history and they will know how to treat you. So that, that those records, those electronic patient records have to be available at every single clinic as long as we're open. That also is used for all of our analytics of the business. We use it for our POS system. It even is working on patient flow on the clinic level. So this is the engine of the business, that IT platform. And we 
recognized this homegrown system had outgrown its use. It wasn't as, as powerful today as it could have been in terms of cybersecurity. And so after, after a lot of uh, challenging thought, we ended up, instead of just rebuilding it, we decided that we we're going to license it. So we entered an agreement with Sugar CRM about two and a half years ago and to help us transform our, our homegrown grown platform to a sugar CRM platform. And we just launched that in July of last, uh, this year. And, um, and again, that was, a, it was an exciting time. It was a challenging time. I was not so worried about the platform itself, but I was terrified about the accurate transfer of the data, the millions of patient records that have to flow seamlessly from this homegrown platform to this new platform that's not built the same way and it has to be perfect. And that we certainly have had our bugs and our enhancements that we're working through, but it's been a pretty seamless transition between one and the other. But that's just the beginning. And now I need to unleash the power of that data. So when I think about the future and what's next, if I'm not able to unleash that or unharness the power of this extraordinary data that we have about this business, about our patients, about how they operate, how we can be more effective in marketing to them, how we can make sure we better understand this business and focus on what we should be doing next, then again, a missed opportunity. So those are the three things that I know have to occur to stay on this trajectory. And if we look a little bit further out, let's say five or 10 years from now, is international on the radar at all? Are there any countries where this model would translate well? Or are you just, we have this gigantic TAM in the US and it's not even worth even considering until you, you know, you've really tapped the potential in, in, the, in the domestic market. The reality is there's absolutely an international opportunity and the opportunity is going to be a direct relationship to chiropractic care already existing in that market. That we don't have the resources to educate a market that has no experience with chiropractic and is no one even knows what it is and say, hey, can come to the joint. And so for, this literally happened. I had a, a group from Saudi Arabia come to me and say, look, you know, we are a very successful multi-unit franchisor. We understand retail in this market. We, have, we control the Middle East. You know, we want to bring the joint. I'm like, well, what kind of chiropractic market is it? Well, there isn't one. Well, how many doctors are there? Well, there aren't any. Well, import them. And I'm like, hmm, this feels premature. <laughs> and so if there's not already that tradition for chiropractic, I don't have the resources to educate a consumer about the power and efficacy of chiropractic. This again is access. It's not education about chiropractic itself as much. And so when you look at markets like Canada, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, England, Northern regions, Australia, uh, uh, Germany, Switzerland, all are markets that have a tradition of chiropractic care. Now there still needs to be more research to truly understand would our market, would our concept be viable in those markets? Cause they all have their own social healthcare systems that may or may not cover chiropractic that may influence the way in which we'd operate in that country. So there's a lot of thought that needs to go into that. Most of my career has actually been international. And what I would tell you is it's an amazing place to be um, that where we are with our international today is really opportunistic is that if the right person came to me from that country where there's a strong tradition and said, listen, I have the perfect background. I know what I'm doing. I understand the retail market and I understand the chiropractic market and I can leverage your concept in this country and we can come to a, a, a relationship that makes sense. Absolutely, I'd respond. Am I taking strategic upfront dollars to develop the international when I still have so much untapped opportunity in the United States today? Um, not yet. And I could probably keep you on, on here for three hours and I've got a bunch of questions that we're definitely not going to get to, but we're going to close with, with my favorite question and, and the one we always close with, which is what would you say is the most misunderstood or underappreciated aspect of, of this company and, and, and business? If I were to answer that question, I would say the most unappreciated or under, misunderstood aspect of this business is chiropractic care. Um, it, it really, it's, it's interesting to me how little it's known, how, how few people truly understand it, the power that it has, and it, and it affects you in all kinds of different ways as an organization. So, for example, on the franchise sales side, is that the two barriers that we face, the biggest barriers we face in selling franchises in this country is, number one, nobody thinks that a chiropractic clinic is franchisable. 
So they're not like, oh my gosh, I've decided to leave my company. I'm so frustrated. I'm going to go buy a franchise. Mm, am I going to buy frozen yogurt or chiropractic care? <laughs> they're like, what? Chiropractic is franchise? That doesn't make sense. And so that they, they'll stumble into us in a health and wellness space so that they, they, they know health and wellness is a huge area right now, very hot. They don't want to do food. I don't want the kids. I don't want the grease. So that they're, they're kind of looking, they each will go down their own path. But there's not an easy and natural path to say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize, of course, chiropractic is franchise. And so, and of course, we're the first franchisor of chiropractic care in the world then let's assume they overcome that concept. It's like, okay, this franchise. Well, don't I have to be a doctor to be a franchisee of chiropractic? And of course the answer is no, uh, but you have to overcome that. So even from the franchise sales side, that's, that's, that's a big misunderstanding. The other side of that is again, from the consumer's perspective, is that, that they don't understand chiropractic. Now they, they can, and over time, you know, we are obviously increasing market share every time we open up a clinic and get people to trial. But we have a lot of white space out there to educate consumers about that. Investors as well. I was just talking to an investor earlier this year who had been following us all along. He's very close to a, a very close to one of our sell side analysts who's been covering us from the beginning. And he's like, oh my gosh, you really need to see what the joint's doing. It's so interesting and they're growing so quickly. And that's something that you should consider for your investment portfolio. And, and he has actually a medical doctor. And, and he's like, hmm. Yeah, that's in chiropractic. That doesn't make sense. And just the fact that it was chiropractic was a barrier for him to even look at it. Now he's looking at it and he's wishing that he had looked further <laughs> two or three years ago when he was first exposed, but he actually has acquired shares and he's kicking himself for, for being so slow to even consider chiropractic as something to invest in. So I, I, I think that just that's the biggest challenge that we face. And just educating any of our stakeholders about what is chiropractic and why it's such a powerful way to help people address pain. Well, Peter, this has been a really interesting and an eye-opening discussion about you know your history and what you've learned and you being a student of the franchise business and then how you've applied that to um, the joint. So thanks so much for, for being a part of the, the Compounders podcast. We really appreciate your time. Uh, the pleasure is mine. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me to be here. I really appreciate it and uh, look forward to doing it again. Thanks, Peter. All right. Take care. That's it for our show today. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. We recognize that you have a lot of different podcast choices and we appreciate you spending the time with us. We are continually working to make the show better and we would love your feedback. The more candid and honest, the better. And if you have any suggestions for public company CEOs you would like to see on the podcast, please let us know. And of course, warm intros are always appreciated. Please feel free to email us at podcast at co-streetcapital.com with your comments or suggestions. Thanks again, and stay tuned for the next episode of Compounders, Anatomy of a Multibiker.